So what do I want? He wasn't chosen yet. You've got to be careful of this. <clears throat> because this is something, if any of you read that book of mine from last year, well, why should heaven choose you? Heaven didn't. I chose heaven. It's a totally different thing. I didn't. It, it didn't choose anything. It's like it, it's like Disneyland, you know. You've got all these pretty things inside there, and if you put four bucks in the gate box, you can get in and see them. I was willing to pay the entry price. I'm not calling heaven Disneyland. Don't get that one. Um, what I'm saying, what I'm saying was, a price was told to me. Clean up your life, or clean up this, or clean up that. Take a good look at everything you've done, set it to rights, automatically the gate opened. It's a very different matter. <laughs> There's no, the, none of you should think that if you read this that, oh, well, I'm not good enough, I can't make it to this. Nonsense. A price is demanded of each one. For every one of you, it's totally different. I don't know what the heck you've got up to. But you will be required to pay that particular price. If you pay that price, the gate will open. There's nobody stopping you going in other than you. And that was something that the doctor was talking about last night, uh, yesterday afternoon, do you remember? The psychiatrist who died and was brought back, he was taken through three realms by the being of light. Since he wasn't a... Cre since he wasn't a uh, Christian or anything else. He had no name for it, so he just called it the being of life. And somebody said, well, was it energy? No, definitely it was a being. Or was it Christ? No, I don't believe in Christ. Or was it, no, I don't, but it was a being of life, which was fine. Nobody, nobody was going to argue about that. He got this being there. So, he goes with this being, and the first place he goes to was exactly like here, except that there was absolutely no love at all. And he really didn't like it particularly. The thing was, he hadn't seen why he had been taken to that place first. After he'd been, after he'd died, he was dead for nine minutes. And well, the doctor pronounced him dead twice. He was dead for nine minutes. The, uh, he finds himself looking at this dead body. He's sitting on the side of his hospital bed, looking at the dead body, which is covered by a sheet. And he doesn't particularly like being around something that's dead. I mean, it, he, he wants to get away from this. He doesn't want to sit beside a dead body. And he hadn't made the connection as to why the first place he went to was loveless. And the answer was exactly in his sitting on the bed, not wanting to be with his own dead body. He had no love for himself. Therefore, how could he go to a place where there was love? Turn the stream of compassion within, says the Buddhist scripture. If you do not love yourself, if you despise yourself or any part of yourself, physical or mental or spiritual, then how can you know love? You have to love you before you can love somebody else. Really love. Otherwise it is trying to get the love out of another being. I'll steal your love. I want love, I want love. How many times have you heard it? And you're trying to steal it from somebody else. But you have to love yourself first. You have to know it before you can give it. See what I mean? People suffer from the idea that when they have had enlightenment experience, Kenshaw in Zen, then they are fully enlightened. Enlightenment only lasts if you keep the training up. He had this flash of enlightenment. And what did he do? He immediately went out afterwards and danced around yelling and screaming, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, and was worse off almost than he had been before it. And so, all right, now you've got to train yourself. You've seen what you are possible, what you are capable of. You've been able for a moment to see humility and compassion. Now, the next thing you must do is immediately Train yourself to keep it. It is an aspect of the cosmic Buddha. His three main aspects, compassion, love, and wisdom. Compassion comes first, which is turning the love within yourself. 
Love comes second. Until you have loved yourself, you cannot give love outside. That is why I said that one was passive and the other was active. When you have turned the stream of compassion within, you have learned to love every part of you. Then you can turn the stream of compassion out, which becomes love. And the marriage of these two is the little child, wisdom. Many of the pictures of the East, you see compassion as a mother, pouring the waters of compassion onto the world, onto the sea of the world. And behind her comes the little son, which is the result of her marriage to forget who is love. So that which is born of compassion and love is wisdom. We personify them in Buddhism because we have no alternative. How else can you explain it, especially in a country like China, which has a pictorial language where everything is explained in pictures or stories? You see what I'm getting at? They all have a philosophical meaning, an abstract meaning. And then you have these lovely pictures that, to us, look like just pictures. But they are a lot more. They're explaining an abstract thing. Greed looks outward and sucks. Yeah. It sucks in. It, it's empty inside and it grasps outwardly to fill. When you forget about that for an instant or for a longer period of time, and you turn around and you look inward, and you see that it doesn't need filling. Then there is nothing to grasp for. There is no point. And then you can feel empathy with, sympathy with, whatever word you want, other beings, because you aren't trying to suck and grasp any longer at that instant. You can see what's there. And what naturally arises when you see what's there is compassion, fellow feeling, sympathy. But then another step beyond that is to know what to do about it and to be able to actively do and give out, which is love, which is where it comes to the, to the active aspect. But first you have to turn it inward, forget about that for a moment and turn inward and see what is really there. And that's what converts it. A person can know when it is true love of another person. For example, if you can truly love another person without being selfish, without being greedy, if you can really put yourself in his situation and become one with him at all times in those situations, then the person has learned to love himself. But if he does not, if he is not capable of that, he has not learned to love himself. Yeah. To me, self-love is based on acceptance. And it isn't always happy. No, it isn't. It's very frequently unhappy. But it's based on accepting what there is here. And knowing that that is, that is what there is here. That's what I have to work with. That's me. It's all right. I can do something about the, those aspects of me which should have something done about. There are parts of me that make me sad when I see them. But if I can accept those things, then there is self-love. Then there is peace, acceptance of Yes, he's talking about a step further back than I was. I was talking about how can you tell when a person is suffering from self-love in the real sense or when, when it is egocentric. And the answer is I always tell by the fruits from another person. 
if they're doing harm to the person they love, instead of being willing to give, if they're always trying to get, then it is definitely self-love in the wrong sense. Apropos the demon that our friend mentioned just now, there's one word that has not come up in this. And I have often thought of the demon, of the demon as karma, that you didn't know anything about, that just comes up and slugs you every now and then, you know, for no particular reason. I was talking to uh, one of the monks in Shasta, who is a very nice young man, but he used to be a professional football player, wasn't he? I think he was a professional. He's colossal, and like some football players I know, not everything is up here, shall we say. Um, <laughs> a lot of it is in other places. <laughs> and I knew the only way I could explain Zen to him was in terms of football. <laughs> so I pointed out that Nirvana was the goal. And here he was with his Buddha nature, the ball, running with it, <laughs> trying to get to the goal. And every now and then a full back of karma would come across and clobber him on the way. Now, that's actually what the demon does. I don't know anything about football. I know those three terms. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to be willing to use things like that. You've got to but do you see what I'm getting at? The demon is actually the karma, the X factor about which you know nothing. Stuff that we can understand it, well, I know what I got up to in my youth, you can say, and some of this stuff can come back and slug me now that I'm older, or um, how, how many times have you heard uh, your past comes up and hits you? Because it does come up and hit you. But there's also past and past. It doesn't necessarily have to be passed from this life. You know, there's, another, there's another point there. That little still small voice, the little thing that taps you on the shoulder, is terribly important because that is the thing that will eventually take you all the way to spirituality. That's the voice of spirituality, which is speaking in very practical terms, which wants your good. And if you follow that voice, you will never be misled by it. It will never lie to you. Unfortunately, we've trained our young people, we train our children not to listen to it, which is very sad. Up to about the age of seven, a child does. And we start gradually training it out of that. And I often think it's the reason why the Catholic Church says that a child up to the age of seven does not sin and after the age of seven, does. When a child dies, if I remember rightly, they say, may he rest in peace after the age of seven, but before that, he rests in peace. And it's because the child goes along with that little voice, which protects it. And then we educate it out of this. And we literally split body and soul apart, or body and mind, as it is called in Buddhism. And the whole purpose of meditation is the harmonization of body and mind, i.e. bringing the two back together again, which starts with listening to that little voice. And then you start arguing because you've got a grown-up head, well, how do I know which little voice I'm hearing? How many are you hearing? I only hear one. And how many have you got? You First of all, you've got to understand that because you've thought about something, you have not necessarily done something that can damage yourself or in any way harm your spiritual side. Remember that the brain is a computer. We suffer from the idea that the brain is in command. It is not. And you do not make genuine spiritual progress until the brain, metaphorically speaking, throws its arms in the air and says, I give up to the spirit. Now, once the spirit is in control, the brain can have any thought under the sun, and should. The brain's job is to present all possibilities to the spirit, for the spirit to choose which one's right for the spirit. Therefore, if a lustful thought comes up, or if um, an unlustful thought, or any other thought comes up, all the computer is doing is spewing out paper 
and saying these are all the possibilities. Your brain is not necessarily bad. The brain being a brain is doing nothing wrong. What matters is what you personally do with the information that you've got. So stop worrying about the thoughts. If the spirit's in control, the brain is doing quite right to present everything to it. For example, when somebody turns up to see me, a monk, shall we say, who's just um, spilled all the soup or broken half the crockery or something similar, my brain presents me with a number of possibilities. I can slug him, I can yell at him, I can forgive him, I can make him pay up. My brain is not doing wrong at presenting me with this whole collection of information. These are the possibilities. My job is to choose one. Now what I choose, that is the willful act. The secret of life is will. Words are its key, says the scriptures. Here's all the words, here's all the possibilities. Now what I do will decide what will happen to my spirit and what I am going to have to pay at a late pay for at a later date. What is the remedy for obsession? Meditation is the only answer I can give you. Because unless you can see clearly how it comes up, why it arises, what causes it, unless you can know yourself absolutely, you will never know what is the cause of obsession. And the only way you can do that is to dig into yourself and find out why. There is no easy answer to that other than self-inspection. No third party can do it for you. You can read dozens and dozens of books, but the only cure is to look at yourself and see why. See how it arises, when it arises. Take great note of the time of day, the situation you are in, the person you are with. Learn all of this, study it, write it down if necessary. After a bit, after two or three weeks, you'll have a pattern as to how the, the, the obsession takes over. And then you'll be able to start doing something about it. I would tell them to note when it comes up, is it specifically morning or is it night or is it afternoon? Is it when they're tired or when they're hungry? or when, sometimes it's even when they've been satisfied in all these things and there's nothing else to do and it's caused by boredom. But they do, there is a pattern in every single obsession. I have yet to find a person who did not have a pattern in it. And once he was aware of that pattern, he could do something about it. Yes, really, I wouldn't recommend that. Yes. To me also, it means that something, something within is trying to tell you something. It's not some it's not some foreign body that you're trying to dig up to dig down to, to remove as you would a you know a, a sledger or something. Something is trying to teach you something. And if you can get down to what what that is, it, it actually becomes something you can be, be very grateful for. You can find out what 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 when you find out what it is, it, it's something you needed to know, something you need to do. It's not a, uh, it's not, a, it's not a negative thing. Yet. In the end, it becomes something positive, something that you can learn from and be grateful for. Yes. And uh, in that way, I don't view it as, as something that you would call a, a pathology or a disease or something. Yes, it gets in the way of a lot of things one would like to do in life. In that sense, you can call it that. But on a deeper level, doggone it, something's trying to tell you something. It's something you need to know. And unless you understand its pattern, you can't see exactly what it is trying to tell you. And when you found out its pattern, you can deal with it in the sense of not throwing it away, but converting it into something else. <coughs> you notice that Monkey did not throw away his greed, hate, and delusion. He converted them into compassion, love, and wisdom, so that it was an integrated whole. And any obsession, once converted, can lead a man all the way to spirituality, if he converts it correctly. He can't throw stuff away from himself. 
he has to look at it and work with it because it's part of himself. While the biggest danger is trying to throw out something from yourself. Trying to throw out your bestial nature, as I've had some people. I am obsessed by my bestial nature. I must throw it out. You have to love the beast. You have to convert the beast. The beast is part of you. You can't throw it out. What you convert it to is not, it's, it's not converting it into something it's never been before. It's, it's returning it to its source. Returning its source to was pure. Yeah. Its source was pure. Its source was good. Its source did not want to hurt self or other. So it's not really some, it's not really taking taking it and, and shaping it as something completely different that's alien to itself and sticking it out when you hear something. It's returning it to its original source. Now, this is what we were talking about last night when we were talking about Buddhist um, exorcisms. You do not push something out, throw it out, go back to hell, go back to hell. You say, go back to your rightful place, for there indeed you are a beautiful Buddha. Within your rightful place, you are as you should be. I do not turn away from you. Come, I embrace you. In your true place, you are as you should be. You are not rejecting it. You are not casting it out, sending it into utter darkness, because then you've got darkness and light. You're back in the world of the opposites. And all you have really done is put the thing you've temporarily allayed the problem. You have not cured it. I have been looking recently through some of these um, books on how to do psychic healing and the like, because a lot of people want to fiddle around in things of this sort. And there is no way you can do psychic healing on the ways in which they are mentioning because all they are doing is dealing with symptoms for the moment. They have not learned to do the embracing from within, so that the thing is converted. They're only dealing with it externally in that sense, although it's on a psychic level. It seems to me that at the bottom of, of an obsession or, or, or of anything else, what you find is some aspect of compassion or love, often love or wisdom, that through very devious means through circumstances and through all kinds of things has gotten twisted and turned around and convoluted on itself and, until it comes up as being something something that, that causes hurt or causes harm. And as, as, it, as through meditation as these things come up and it gradually sort of untwists itself and it often looks as if it's getting worse and more painful as it goes down. But if you keep going with it, the person can stand to keep going at the bottom. Usually lies love, or sometimes compassion or wisdom. It's an exquisite thing to see. There's always love at the bottom. There is, to me, there, there, there is nothing uh, either, either right or wrong, good or bad, anything of the sort about emotion. It comes. It's, it's naturally, it naturally arises as a part of living. It, this is part of <coughs> part of the experience that comes up. All right. Now, are you going to allow that to control your life, to control the spiritual aspect, to control that which knows what is ultimately good to do, or are you going to allow it to come up? Neither push it away. Neither repress it nor fall head over heels along with it. Simply allow it to arise. Allow it to be expressed if that is what is good. Allow it to pass on when its time is over. Or are you going to get completely caught up by it? The same way you can with intellect or with anything else. This process that we're speaking of does not eliminate emotion. It does not make one into an iceberg or a dried prune. Not it does anything but. Yes, if anything, it frees it up. <coughs> and there are times when it is good to express that emotion outwardly completely. Yeah. And there are times when it is good not to do so. Well, the emotion of love, of love, and you frequently be, 
as an expression of non-love in the sense of I want because I cannot feel I want. That is the danger of the emotion of love. The love that lies at the love that lies at the bottom of everything is a rather different thing. Um, if you've studied Zen an awful lot, you've heard of what's called the koan, the problem that uh, one has to deal with, the spiritual problem that is peculiar to each, per each one of us. For one of us, it may be a search for freedom. For another, it may be uh, a search for love. For a third, a search for something else. And as you deal with that koan, gradually a pattern emerges. Because in each one, as you go down the set of koans that are peculiar for you, and in Soto Zen, which is what I do, you find your own. You do not have the pattern that Rinzai Zen has. As you go down that, you begin to see a pattern emerge. And when you've dealt with it in this life, and of course we believe in past lives, we believe in rebirth, you then have to deal with it in your past lives. And when you get to the end of that war, when you actually find its source, you discover invariably that it was love that went very slightly overboard in one sense, or slightly wrong in another, or doubted itself for a fraction of a second. And the source is always this exquisite love. And that is what is so beautiful. process you have to discover for yourself what those hallmarks are for you. Um, one, thing that one thing that helps discover them <coughs> is some form of meditation, some form of continual awareness, some sort of training in, in, in meditation, right? in that you tend not to fuzz out your consciousness as much and sort of glide over things. That helps. But that doesn't. That in and of itself may not be sufficient. The other thing is to try your darndest to do that which is good in the sense of right in your own heart, as best you know it, and then keep your eyes open and see what happens. You'll find out quite quickly whether you're really following your heart or not. If you are, it will, it will, not, produce, it will not produce suffering. It, it may produce things which are unpleasant in a sense, but it will not produce suffering. It will not produce deep pain, sorrow. And if you're mistaking, if you're making a mistake, you get it, you get it to a mess really quickly. If you keep your wits about you in this process, you gradually discover for yourself what the whole marks are. And they get a little bit clearer, and each, each time a little bit clearer, and you don't have to let the situation go quite so far, quite so long, until you start seeing it. But I can't tell you what the whole marks are for you. It's very much a trial and error business. Why it sometimes why why it takes so long to do it. and why it takes so much effort to do it. and they're different for everybody and why why there's this business about this continual energy that you have to pour into this in order to do it in order to do it well because it does it, it takes time it's it's in the beginning especially it's a very slippery sort of thing. <coughs> was arranged right on top and I was beginning to go towards the wall to listen. The person in charge of meditation came up, tapped me on the shoulder and said, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> and the pie disappeared. That was the thing that got me. I just, um, so watch it, what you're doing. Just do four or five minutes properly. And after a bit, if you do four or five minutes properly, you'll come to it eager. Oh, let's do more. And within three months, you'll be doing 45 minutes a day, night and morning, and you'll be doing it well. 
Now, how to work up from that if you have pains and aches is very simple. Start with five minutes. And if you find you can sit comfortably for five minutes and you thoroughly enjoy it, say, all right, tomorrow I'll try 10. Now, probably it'll be, ooh, after seven. So, all right, push yourself to sit eight, because you mustn't let the body win. It has rights, but you mustn't let it win. So push yourself to eight. After a week, you can do eight perhaps incredibly well. So you push yourself to nine. And so you push it up. But remember, you are not here to, show an, to do an endurance test. You are here to learn to meditate. And above all, do not push yourself so that you hate the thought of meditation. I have seen, this is one of the saddest things I've seen. Teachers who have pushed people and in the end, the person, after a week, has dreaded going to the meditation hall. Because, oh, I can't move for 40 minutes. What am I going to do? And they've ended up by doing nothing more. In general, we, we don't sit in formal seated meditation for more than about 40 minutes in the shot. 45. You to, you know, either do walking meditation or go to work or do something else. 40 minutes. 45 minutes is the limit. It's about about what most people can do without getting sufficiently... Uh, and it's tired. important to remember that the great Zen masters in Japan never do more than 45 minutes at a stretch, too. Okay. Now, I will point out one other important thing. You've got, we've read in a lot of books, it says that this is the place from which you're sitting. I agree, it is. But not everybody's there at once. A lot of people, when they first start, seem to feel their seat of consciousness is here on the tip of the nose. Others feel it's here, others feel it's here. Don't worry where it is. And above all, don't worry if it moves. Let it go, does it? It moved, it, 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 it. I've seen people do this in meditation halls. My, my seat of consciousness moved, it sort of moved up here. Uh, is there something on my forehead? No, 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 just. You're getting a little more into religion, into religious practice, and you're beginning to get a little more spiritual. Don't worry about it. If it moves, the places it will move to, and I have no idea what order they will be in for you, is here, 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 here. This is where it's got to end up. When it ends up in here, you know you're right. But don't worry about the others. It'll go at its own free time and its own speed. By being aware of yourself, you can see yourself. By seeing yourself, you say, I'm not too pleased with what I am like. By saying that, you say, I must do something about me. <clears throat> and by doing that, you change the world and yourself. Meditation does not always make life more peaceful. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes some people have often said, you know, I must be meditating wrong because I, it's, it's, you know, I'm just seeing you know, wreckage all around me. And what I'm, what I'm doing everywhere is just producing all of this, this, this harm, these complications and things. Well, it could be. It isn't always the case, but it could be that they're starting to really meditate. And they're seeing what they've been doing all along. Been doing for centuries. Word of word. <coughs> It's sometimes a very uh, <coughs> sobering business. Now, when you've finished meditating, start small with your circles clockwise, and get them bigger so as to get the whole body loosened up. And then you can get up quite easily and your legs are not stiff. Okay. It's a little difficult off the floor. Normally you're up on that. Um, one other point that a lot of people miss, whatever you do, punch your cushion up. Because these things get bunched in such a way, they get like bricks. And then somebody says, I don't know why I can't sit and meditate. It's murder on that cushion. Yeah, I bet it is. Now that's what a cushion should look like when you puff it. Nice and fluffy. Yeah. Light. <laughs> <laughs> Just sit. Try this about four or five minutes a day, or if you have your own practice, use that. 
the nice, the, the beauty of this particular form is that anybody, whether Christian, Jew, or anything else, can use this. Can use this particular method of sitting in meditation. It's not going to conflict with his uh, beliefs. So anyone can sit and do it by this method. Just sit still and see what happens. I guarantee you something will. When you don't give it a specific focus, like counting the breaths or thinking of a specific sound or mantra or something, what you're really you're focusing on is that which is. Which is why I don't like these, unless somebody is having real problems, why I don't like using um, tools such as counting breaths and mantras and uh, koans for people who do not specifically need them. Now, somebody who's a very high... Uh, well, we've, we've bumped into people who are using their intellect all the time, going at tremendous speed, the brain's revving all the time, living in dialectic philosophy and all this sort of thing. Such a person needs a koan just to slow him down. Uh, in other words, he needs to give. He needs to shut up the racket in his head, so that the Lord of the house can get a word in edgewise. How, how do we we, we we do get together? That sort of thing happens. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> how did I end up here? I don't know. How did you end up here? Know. You tell me how I you could, ended up here. Well, yeah, I think it's a highly individualistic thing. Right? <laughs> uh, that's very evident. So I, you know, we only speak from one's own personal experience. I think it's uh, very intuitive. Um, how did I end up here? Let's see. I started off... Um, but well, as I mentioned before, I got involved in Buddhism in the first place because I was an empiricist who wanted, who, who felt the need for something in the general area of religion. Right? And the only, the only religious path that I bumped into at the time that fit with my sort of empirical uh, way of thinking was Buddhism because it said, you know, don't believe this just because it's written in the scriptures. Try it and see what happens, basically. Um, so I just sort of happened to bump into it in that sense, and it made sense to me, so I just, right, let's try it. Did some reading about it. Bumped into a friend of mine who I hadn't seen in a number of years who had been um, involved in uh, Buddhist training with uh, a priest, uh, Reverend Wagner, who was at that time in San Francisco and is now in Los Angeles. An American man who stu studied uh, several different Buddhist traditions, had a small, small temple. And uh, so I went with my friend to that temple, and uh, what this man was saying uh, made a great deal of sense. And it just seemed to feel right. So I you know, learned how to meditate and did more of that, and uh, just sort of gradually got more and more involved in it. And uh, then I went, up to, uh, I went up to Oregon to go to grad school, and uh, it was a long drive from Eugene back to San Francisco, so I didn't do it very often. And uh, at one point, I, he, he mentioned to me that there was this Roshi who had come over from Japan, who was a friend of his, who was settling in Mount Shasta. Well, now that's half, half as far, and it's much less of a drive, so I decided, what the heck? Uh, why not you know, try it out? Because he recommended her, and I, had, I trusted his judgment. And so I came to Shasta and visited a couple of times. And it seemed to me that this, you know, what Rushi was saying made even more sense, sort of on an intuitive level as well as on an intellectual level. And I just sort of felt, had a funny kind of feeling that I was at home. I couldn't explain it exactly, but I sort of knew I was home here. This is my home. Uh, that's interesting. I kept on going to grad school, did various things, and went there on vacations for once in a while. Um, kept up the practice at home, at home and uh, tried to do as best I could. And then when I finished my internship, I decided, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm really going to have to take a whole year out, go up there, <laughs> up to Shasta, and really spend a year... That was his mistake. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> really spend a year really getting my practice down really solidly so that I can go, when I, when I leave, I can go back and really keep it up and really, really firmly when I'm doing my job out in the world. 
And so I you know, arranged for a job the following year and had it all set up. Went up there and uh, they all smelled monk meat. They didn't tell me that. <laughs> Absolutely was not going to become a monk. There was no way. I told him. Nobody that. mentioned that he should. No way. <laughs> Absolutely no one. Uh, not, not, since we had that settled, then I could you know go down. <laughs> well, about three, four months after I'd been there, I just decided that uh, it made more sense to be doing this than it did to go teach at the University of Denver. So I called up Denver and they. Fortunately, they couldn't get the funding for my job anyway. They were kind of red-faced, wondering what they were going to say to me. And I was sort of sitting there saying, gee, how do I get out of this contract? And we said, hey, how about that? <laughs> Great. <laughs> we can both get out of the contract without anybody getting hurt. And I just stayed on. Came and went. And uh, so that funny kind of feeling that I was at home. I don't know where that came from. 